All right, Psalms chapter 18. Psalms chapter 18. I did neglect to mention, but if you could pray for me Friday, I'm preaching over at Ellicott Baptist Church, and Lord willing, there'll be some lost folks there. Um, maybe, you know, when you do teen fundraisers, and I know a lot of their teens, their parents are in the church, uh, but there's always going to be a few teens that their parents will come to a dinner on a Friday that they wouldn't come otherwise. So I'm looking to hopefully reach some souls and uh, also just encourage the church there. And I always need help. Uh, I, I know you may not understand this, but it's one thing to preach on a Sunday in a very formal setting. When it's informal, it kind of changes the whole dynamics, makes it weird. And I make things weird anyway, so I need a little help. Uh, I know God will give it to me. Amen. Amen. Psalms chapter 18. If you look at it, if you just glance at it, it is, a, it is quite the Psalms. It's all of 50 verses. Buckle up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're only actually going to cover the first three verses. From what I can tell as of right now, we're going to have at least five sermons out of this. We're good. We're, we're going to have five sermons out of this. At least. at least five sermons so far, from what I can tell. So we're going to read the first three verses. And uh, real quick, before we read the passage, if you just look at the title, I don't know if you have the title under Psalms 18 in your Bible, uh, in, in case you... Uh, so sometimes it's abbreviated. Sometimes it says like a mictum of David or a prayer of David. Here's what my Bible says as the title for Psalms 18. You ready for this? To the chief mu musician, a psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said... Yeah, so, so sometimes you get that in your Bible. Um, though, that's, that's quite a lengthy title. We don't have to wonder what this is about, though, do we? You don't have to wonder what Psalms 18 is about. You, just a casual reading, you can, you can read just from the title. This is a song that he sang to the Lord when he was delivered from Saul and the other enemies. So you kind of know the background already. I would like to help you understand. That doesn't mean this all happened all at once. So what he was singing about, which we'll cover here through the next few weeks is stuff that may have happened at different times. It was just when it was done, it was a time where he just kind of reflected on the, the Lord's deliverance. But we're going to focus on just the first three verses this evening. So if you would please, stand in honor of God's word if you're able and willing. And we'll read the first three verses. Gives you a little hope for tonight, doesn't it? Whew, only three. Verse number one. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, help us with this message tonight. Lord, I'm excited about it. Uh, maybe even, even a little overly excited, but that, that can mean that my, my brain kind of skips some things out of excitement. Help give me clarity of thought. Help me organize this thing as I'm preaching it in a way that would uh, convey the truth that I believe this, this first three verses has for us. And the Lord open our hearts to the truth of it. It, it really has changed my thinking. Uh, and I, I'm hoping it changes the thinking of the people here tonight. I ask that you help us with that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. I titled the message... But why? But why? All right, I got, a, I got a funny, it's not a real story, it's a funny fake story, but bear with me. An elderly man on the beach found a magic lamp. He picked it up and the genie appeared. Because you have freed me, the genie said, I will grant you a wish. The man thought for a moment and then responded, my brother and I had a fight 30 years ago, and he hasn't spoken to me since. I wish that he'd finally forgive me. There was a thunderclap, and the genie declared, Your wish has been granted. You know, the genie continued, Most men would have asked for wealth or fame, but you only wanted the love of your brother. Is it because you are old and dying? He said, No way. But my brother is, and he's worth about 60 million. <laughs> This man, oh, man. this man wanted his brother to forgive him and love him, but the reason for it wasn't very noble, was it? No. Alright, let me ask you a question tonight. Let me ask you a question. Everybody can participate. This one you can answer out loud. Next question, don't, because I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. Do you love God? Yes or no? Yes. yes. 
Amen. I was hoping you'd say that because if you said no, I have a whole different message we got to preach tonight. Uh, back to Genesis 1. I'm just kidding. Uh, what if I asked you, but why? Now, don't answer that one out loud. Before you answer, you may be like me and say, this is what I would have answered before I, I studied out this text. This would have been something of what I would have answered. Because he first loved me. I think that's a good answer. Because he died for me. Another good answer. Because he blesses me. Another good answer. And I understand all of those reasons. And we all may have something like that. But if you ask David, why do you love God? He'd have told you a whole different reason. A whole different reason. Maybe even a profound reason. Look back at the text with me. It starts with a proclamation. No, no, I know. A casual reading of a casual reading of Psalms chapter 18 would lead you to believe that this is a chapter to praise the Lord for his deliverance. And that's true. But understand this. God, God had his had, had been inspired to write the words of the Bible exactly how they were written and exactly the order they're written for exactly this reason. He's trying to tell us something every time. So when you look at Psalms chapter 18, notice before we ever, before we ever get to a place. Where, God's, or where, where David says something that God did for him, what is the very first thing he says? Verse number one, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. No, no, think about that. No, he didn't say, God, you've been my great deliverer. I'm going to love you. God, you keep taking care of me. I'm going to love you. God, you keep being good to me. I'm going to love you. He determined before he even talked about anything that God did for him. He said, understand this. I will love you, Lord. I am determined to love you, Lord. My strength. We often stand around and wait for God to do something and then we will praise. But the reality is we are supposed to praise him because he's God. Period. No, no, I know. He's done a lot for us. It's, it's not a wrong answer for me to say, I love God because He first loved me. It's not a wrong answer for me to say, I love God because he, he died for me. That's not a bad answer to say, God, I love you because you blessed me. But all of those are still secondary to the fact that we are supposed to love and praise Him simply because He is. Amen. Period. So what if He never did anything for us? Doesn't matter. We're still supposed to love and praise Him. Because he is. And if you've ever wondered what made David so different. What made him the, the man after God's own heart. What made him a man where at the end of his life. The only negative thing God ever said about David. Was that his sin with Bathsheba. That's the only thing that God ever brought up again. No he messed up other times. He numbered the people. He did things like that that he wasn't supposed to do. But when it came down to the end of his life. God said I've got one problem with your entire life. This is it. Sin with Bathsheba. Other than that. He was a man after God's own heart. How is that possible? Could it be that he approached his love for God in a way that none of us do? No, I know. You think, I, I, I may be even assuming here. But David said, I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. That love there speaks of, it's an investment love. An investment love. Understand this, an investment love without any expectations. That's a hard kind of love, isn't it? That's loving for the sake of love. By the way, husbands, men, that's, that's how we were instructed to love our wives. With an, with an unexpected love. Not, not an unexpected like, oh, you shocked me with that love. It's a love that expects nothing in return. And if, if, if we don't, by the way, if we don't have that kind of love, if you don't love your spouse for just the love of love, for the sake of love, it's not going to last. Holly and I are still young. She's still my, my young, beautiful bride. She's still in her 20s. But I realize 30, 40 years from now, we're going to be old and wrinkly. Together. And I'm not, hang on, don't take this the wrong way, but I think you understand what I'm going for. Beauty really is skin deep. There is going to be a point where we're both not going to be... I mean, understand, when I look at pictures of her now, when I looked at pictures of her when we first started dating, I know every reason I was ever attracted to Holly. When we're 80, the list that I would have wrote, written at 25 is non-existent at, at 80. 
by, same for me, by the way. I'm not just saying I'm going to get better looking with age and she's not. I'm saying we're going to get old together. And at that point, hang on, understand this. At that point, if you don't love for simple love's sake, you will not have a marriage. You will not have that love. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, let me take this to God. If we don't love God simply because he is God, then we are going to fail in loving God when he is not doing things for us. We're all going to go through periods in our life where we feel like God ne isn't necessarily helping us like we think he should. God, I shouldn't be in this financial bind. God, I shouldn't have these health struggles. God, I shouldn't. And that, that's a wrong way of thinking. I understand that. But we all go through those times. The life, of, the life of a Christian is not a life of easiness. And it's not a life of peace and simplicity. It's a life of trouble and tribulation. And if we're going through those troubles and tribulations, and we don't love God just because he's God, then we are going to stop loving God. You want to know how David continued to love God as he's running for his life, as he's hiding in the woods, as he's spending night after night cold and alone? He loved God not because of anything God was doing for him. I, I mean, yeah, I think he even understood as he's hiding that God is who's keeping him safe. God is who's protecting him. But at the same time, God, if you really love me, would I be here? No, he continued to love God despite the fact that his situations were way worse than any of us will ever face. Because he loved God, or he determined, I'm going to love God for nothing. I have no expectations in return. He doesn't have to do a thing for me. I'm going to love and praise him because of who he is. Then he says, my strength. Now, now understand this. He did not say, I will love thee, O Lord, because you're my strength. No, no, that's not what it says, is it? There's no conjunction there. There's no because. He said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. He's implying, God, you are my only option. I'm loving you. And I'm choosing to love you, and you are what empowers me to love you, and I have no other choice. There is no other option for me. You are my strength. I'm not expecting anything of you. This is what I meant by I was excited. Just forget my notes, but might as well. I'm nowhere near them. <laughs> David loved God unexpectedly, and it led him... To being, to being able to continue to love God while his life was on the line. Before anything else, David made the choice, I will love God. Whether I'm up, whether I'm down, whether I'm the king, whether I'm in a, in a holler down somewhere in, in, the, in the wilderness, scared for my life and hungry, no matter what, I'm going to love God. He's my strength. He's the only reason I can continue on as I go on. How about you? Why do you love God? And what kind of love are we talking about? The type of love that will love as long as there is something in it for you? No, that's a lot of relationships. You want to know why relationships don't really work today? It's not because God's design failed. It's because we let go of God's design. Well, relationships don't last because here's what a relationship is. It's I want something from you. You want something from me. So let's love each other. And then when you no longer fulfill what I'm looking for, I'm no longer in love. I've... And here's the, here's the thing, you'll hear this all the time nowadays. I've just fallen out of love with her. I've just fallen out of love with him. That's not actually how love works. Love is a verb. It is a choice. It is an action. Why do you love God? You know, I bet there's people that have sit, sat in these very pews that love God simply because they thought, as long as I love God, he's going to do some things for me. He's going to help me financially. He's going to help me my health. He's going to help me get a better job. He's going to help me improve. He's going to help my kids improve. And when it didn't seem like God was doing one of those things that they were loving God for, they left. I know I'm really preaching to the choir. I think most of us actually have this concept. But it is a very good time to be introspective and ask yourself, do I love God simply because he's God? Not because he died for me which is a good reason. Not because he loved me first, which is a good reason. Not because he blesses me, which he does, but simply because he is. Before David says anything about what God did for him, he goes on to state what God is to him in verse 2 and 3. Look at verse 2. Notice, I'm serious, I'm stressing this order for, for a reason. He is stressing what God is to him, not what God has done for him. 
No, I know we can misconstrue it. We can read this. Let's read verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I trust, my buckler, my and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower. And you say, well, he's loving God because God is all those things. No, because he has chosen to love God, He God is being those things. I know that's really close. It's easy to get that confused. You may think in your mind, he loves God because God is all of verse 2 to him. And I'm telling you, that's not the order of things. That's not what the Bible says. That's not what David was saying. David was saying, I love you. You are all these things. And I believe you are all these things because I've chosen to love you regardless if you were or weren't. Now that's a mouthful, verse number 2. That's a lot of things. We're going to talk about them, but let me simplify it all into one sentence for you, if I, if, if I can. I will trust you implicitly, Lord. That's what he's saying. That's, that's verse 2. That's all that is. If I could boil verse 2, and I know it's got a lot of things, and we're going to talk about all of them. Don't worry. Don't feel like I'm just going to skip over this. I chose three verses because I knew I could fill the whole time for three verses. <laughs> we're going to talk about it, but if I could just simplify it, this is what David's saying in verse 2. I will trust you implicitly, Lord. Verse 1, I will love you, my strength, O Lord. Verse 2, I will trust you implicitly. You say, how do you know that? Because it shows up right there in the verse, and everything else has to do with trusting God. Verse 2, look at it again, right there in the middle. Whom I will trust. But now let's talk about it. He says, the Lord is my rock. What does that mean? The rock is the place where you can hide, and it's also a good foundation. Those, both of those apply to the rock. Uh, yeah. David knew about hiding in rocks, I believe. He knew about hiding in caves. He knew about living out. Remember, this is what he's saying after he was, was finally victorious over Saul. And the first thing he says, and I imagine he thought about as the rocks that he was hiding in the cleft, and he said, God, you're my rock. You're, you're my foundation and my hiding place. And my, now, now notice the way it's phrased. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. That's in, that, and there's implying that the first thing is just as important as the second. I'm not a grammarian. Uh, sounds good saying that, doesn't it? But, but that's what it means. The and is saying, this part is just so he's saying, you're my rock, and just as much as you're my rock, you're my fortress, which is also a place to hide. But here's the thing about a fortress. It is a place where you can openly feel comfortable. Once you get inside the fortress walls, once you get inside where God is protecting you, you don't have to feel afraid. I praise the Lord. We don't feel afraid in our home ever. It's kind of like our fortress. Because, you know, you lock the doors, you get inside, and at night, I'm not too worried somebody's going to break in. Now, I've got a lot of firearms ready if somebody wants to, but I'm not worried because this is, our safe, this is our safe place physically. And David was saying, God, you're my fortress. When I'm with you, I feel like I don't have to have my guard up. I feel like I don't have to keep uh, my armor ready. I know when I'm, in, when I'm with you, I'm safe. Amen. That's quite the statement. No, I know. We, we read over this, and verse 2 is just one of 50, and we don't even think about the things that he's saying. But he's saying, God, you're my place to hide. You're my foundation. You're a place that I can hide and feel comfortable and safe, and I don't have to be guarded. We have to guard ourselves when we go into this world. We have to understand that when, when, when Ephesians talks about the whole armor of God, it's because we need to put on the whole armor of God to face this world day by day. And, but, when, but what he's saying is, with you, God, I'm good. You are my fortress. You're like my, you're like my, my armor that, that I don't have to put on. You're just there for me. Amazing statement there. He says, and my deliverer. That's pretty simple. I don't think I necessarily have to explain that one too long. A deliverer, somebody that, that takes you to where you need to be, delivers you from harm, keeps you safe. My God. Then he repeats my strength. So God, oh Lord, my strength. Now he's, he's stressed strength twice. God is the thing that keeps him going. That's important. I'm going to use Brother D.O. Van Dyne. I didn't ask his permission, but I don't care what he says anyway. <laughs> Because I love Brother Dio and I know he wouldn't mind. You know how Brother Dio has continued on after the passing of his wife? No, it wasn't because he didn't love his wife. It wasn't because their, their lives weren't completely intertwined together. He's continued on because his wife was not his life. She was not his strength. She may have been part of his strength. 
She may have been what helped him to have strength in the Lord, but his strength is in the Lord. And that's why he can continue without it. Amen. Now, at the point Holly and I are, if one of us passed away tragically in the next few years, we'd probably both get remarried because I'm way too good looking not to. <laughs> no, let's be honest. I got three kids now. I'm going to need some help at least. I'm going to list a nanny if, if nothing else. But there's going to come a point where Holly and I are going to get to a certain age that if she died, I'm not getting remarried. No, I know we're still young. I'm still raising kids. That's a different aspect of life. But when our kids are out of the house, that's probably the point where I'll say, if you died now, I don't want anybody else. Not because she's not important to me. No, in fact, because I, I love our marriage. I, I, we've, we've, we've had so much fun together and I'm hard to get along with. But I'm going to come to a point where that was sweet, but my strength's in the Lord. He's my strength. Amen. Not her, not my position, not my finances, not my retirement. God is my strength. Amen. He goes on to say, and this is what I'm stressing, in whom I will trust. In whom I will trust. Have you ever thought about this, that we will never once say, I trusted God and I shouldn't have? We'll never say that. I don't want to be a downer. We're having a good time. But if you watch the news, it seems to come up regularly enough of a mom that, that murders her own children. It happens more than I wish it did. I mean, I wish it never happened. And the first thought that goes through my mind when I see those kind of things is just, how could someone do that? That's first thought. That's immediate thought. But on along through my thought process, I always come to the point of thinking, those kids trusted her or him. Now, have you ever thought about that? Yeah. How easily they probably murdered their kids because their kid followed them to wherever? Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't that just break your heart? Because they, they trusted in someone that they shouldn't have trusted in. That just tears me up inside. Mm -hmm. And yet, we'll never have that feeling with God. Yeah. We'll never say, I shouldn't have trusted him. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have leaned on I shouldn't have relied on him. That, why did I do that? Look at how this ended. We will never say that. And David never said that for him. He said, I will trust you implicitly. He goes, <clears throat> by the way, just in that, so I'm trying not to miss any of my good, because I, I feel like I got a lot of good stuff. Uh, in, in saying, I will trust in thee, or in whom I will trust, he's implying he can't even trust himself. Have you thought about that? When he's saying, I'm going to trust you, he's saying, I'm not going to trust me. No, I mean, that's the only way. You can only trust in one thing, truly. And he's saying, I'm trusting in you. I'm not even trusting in my own wisdom, my own protection, my own skills. By the way, David was a pretty skilled man. Don't, don't misunderstand. We think of David playing a harp or singing a song, but David knew how to wield a sword, a spear, and some bows and arrows as good as anybody else. He was a man's man. And he could have said, God, I'm going to trust in you to handle some things, but I got some of this. I'm pretty decent in a fight. He didn't say, he said, I'm going to trust in you and you only. You're the only thing I'm going to trust in. I don't want to re-preach Sunday morning's message, but you realize we can't trust ourselves? There's a lot of things I can't trust myself with. My cell phone has, a, has an app on it called Triple, and I know I've told you, but basically what it does is it takes screenshots of my phone throughout the day. I never see them. I don't get to see when it takes it. I have no idea when it's going to take it. And at the end of the day, Holly gets an email with all those screenshots. Everything I see, she sees. So why would you do that? Because I don't trust myself. So why do you struggle? No, but that's the point. I don't want to struggle. I, I, I can't trust me. Let's be honest. We can't trust other people. Men aren't trustworthy. Women aren't trustworthy. Children sure aren't trustworthy. You're a fool if you think you can believe what comes out of kids' mouths. Not my kid. My kid, I trust them to always tell the truth. That's why all adults grow up to be truth tellers. Oh, wait, no, we grow up to be liars. Why? Because we're liars from a, a very young age. Okay. Well, we can't trust in men. We can't trust in our politicians. We can't trust in our military. We can't trust, uh, I'm not saying all police officers, but there's police officers you can't trust. There's people you can't trust in every aspect of your life. You may not trust your boss. You may not be able to trust your co-workers you may not even be able to fully trust your spouse which i hope that's not a problem that's about the only person i do trust completely 100 percent is my wife only because she hasn't burned that bridge ever 
She's built that trust up. But we can't trust people. David said, I'm not worried about trusting other people. I'm not even worried about trusting myself. I trust you. And by the way, this implies that no matter what situation you're in, no matter how you feel like, well, my boss doesn't understand. He actually doesn't like that I'm a Christian or, or my family doesn't understand or this is a problem. No matter what, God will take you through that situation. And while you can't trust all the people involved, you can trust him who is involved, very much involved. And he very much cares. <clears throat> then he goes on to say, he calls God his buckler. You know what that is? Anybody off the top of your head? Just curious. I didn't know. I'm just being honest. I didn't know what a buckler was. Shield. It's a shield. That's right. They, they name things very wisely. So, uh, the buckler was the shield you buckled on your arm. <laughs> so it's the one that kind of like buckled in, strapped in. So typically, as I studied it out, they would be typically round, maybe even, even if it did have edges. Here's the thing. It would have, it would be it would be angled in such a way that things would glance off of it. So like an arrow come, it wouldn't just penetrate, it would hit and have to go, you know, one way or the other kind of thing. And I even thought about that. I'm like, man, not only is not only can I trust God, but, but God is a la layer of protection that I can't have for myself. You know, I mean, think about a shield, a, 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 one of those bucklers, you know, it can reach areas you can't reach. If I just had to, if I had to defend my body with my hands, it'd be pretty hard. I, gotta, I don't have big hands, but they're enough to cover maybe some vital regions, but that's all. But God, he can cover things that you can't cover. He can make sure the fiery darts of Satan or the fiery darts of your enemies just glance right off. But that's why it's so important that we operate inside of God's will and inside of the word of God. Does that make sense? Because when we operate outside of God's word and outside of God's will, what we've essentially done is take that buckler that we have and throw it aside and go, no, I'm going to take on this stuff my own. Here we go. You ready? <laughs> And we, we can't. No, we, we, we can't. I can't. You can't. None of us can. We're not, we're not skilled enough to do that. Obedience and submission afford protection. We obey God. We submit to his word. And it affords us a level of protection that we otherwise would not have. By the way, wives, submitting to your husband, it affords you protection. God didn't, God didn't organize that just because he thought, well, men are the better of the two genders i better put men in charge no 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 he knew this is a great place to be in submission to your husband is a place of protection my wife doesn't have to answer for any of the stupid things i do and she's very happy for that because she gets to stand back and say i just said okay babe whatever you say <laughs> and look at the mess you got us in. <laughs> and she gets to rub that in in our private time he says then he says he's the horn of my salvation now horn designates power Right? Horn is a sign of power in the Bible. Uh, all that, any animal that has horns, uh, you, you're talking about a level of power. And what does he say? Look back at verse 2. And the horn of my salvation. What is he saying there? You are the power of my salvation. I can't save myself. Now there's some, there's some Sunday morning application there. There's some lost people application that he is the only power for salvation. God is the only power of salvation. It is not yourself. It is not your works. It is not your giving. It is not your service. It is not your attendance. It is not your membership. It is not your baptism. God is my salvation. The power. He's the only power of my salvation. Then the high tower. Now this was a place to watch from, but it was also a place of prominence and military, uh, not military power, but here's the, here's the essence of it. Military power would get in a high tower during battles to basically make a plan, right? To strategize. The higher up you can get, the more of the battle you can see. And the, now I know to us nowadays that seems like it doesn't matter. But to their battles, you needed to know where to flank, where to send more troops, where, to, where, where you were losing, where you're winning. And so a place of a high tower was a place of good vantage to get um, victory. What is he saying? He's saying, God, you're my place of victory. As long as I'm with you, you give me wisdom beyond what I could have seen. You give me understanding beyond what I could have known. You are helping me in ways. And if I'm, if you're my high tower, when you lift me up, you allow me to accomplish things I otherwise could not accomplish. It's pretty exciting. We can all try to advance and lift ourselves, but God is the place where I can find guidance and wisdom. And since he knows everything... He can lift me up and put me where I need to be. He's the only one that knows what the future holds. And because he's the only one that knows what the future holds, 
If I'm in his high, if he's my high tower and he's giving me the wisdom to make the right decisions, then I know we're on the right direction because he knows what's coming in the future. Now, verse three says this. We're almost done. We're doing okay, actually. Woo. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Here's what he's, here's what he's saying. I will call on the Lord. So he's saying, I'm going to call out to the Lord who I already proclaimed I love and who I already proclaimed I trust in. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Because God is who he is, because God is all the things that he listed in verse 2, I'm going to choose to trust on him. But also, he's worthy to be praised even if he wasn't all those things in verse 2. Again, don't forget where, 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 what he started with. He said, I'm going to love you, I'm going to trust you, but I'm going to praise you because you're worthy of all that praise. And then, so shall I be saved from my enemies. Because I'm calling on the God who is, because I'm God calling on, I'm loving and I'm choosing to love and trust in the God who is, not for what he can do for me, but because I choose to love him strictly for love's sake, when I do call on him, I know he'll deliver me. You say, well, what about the people who he doesn't seem to deliver that they die? Uh, you don't think heaven's deliverance? It may not be the worst thing to lose physically and die. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. I'll take that. That's a victory. Just saying. My conclusion is simple tonight. Number one, why do you love God? Why do you love God? Really ask yourself that. I... I I'm going to be honest, sometimes I don't think I love God just because He's God. Sometimes I think I love Him strictly because what He's done for me and what He will do for me. And I know that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a bad thing. But David's special because he loved God just because God's God. Expecting nothing in return. And I, it made me ask myself a question that even uh, would be presented there at the beginning of Job. Why do you serve God? Would you love him even if he does nothing for you? Would you love him if you're broke, homeless, poor, uh, tattered clothes, living on the ends, hungry, starving? Would you still love God or would you curse God? Why do you love God? Number two, do you trust him? That's a no. I, you say, well, duh, I trust him. I'm here, aren't I? No, that doesn't mean you trust him. You may say you trust God, but you may trust in your finances. You may trust in me. You may trust in yourself. You may trust in your coworkers or your friends or your accomplices or whatever. And you may claim that, oh, I trust God, but really you've not put anything into God's hands and allowed him to, make, to, to lead you in the right direction into victory. If you don't have the right answers to those, don't bother seeking God for anything else. You have to love God because he is God and you have to trust God because he is God. And if we're all honest, we struggle with both of those. We claim we love God, but the why is not right. We say we trust him because we don't love but because we don't love him for the right reason, we don't really trust him. We trust in ourselves and our money and others. I know. I started the sermon by asking, I know everyone here loves God. But let me end it th with this. But why? But why? Who is God to you? I think that's a question that we, it would be good if we searched our hearts. Who is God to you? Let's pray.